right, still, we got some hands. Yeah, we got some hands over here. Uh, yeah, we can go in the back. Well, we got time. We'll make our way over. Hi, um, I'm Anne Marie. I'm from Orlando, actually. So I know Carlos. Or, also. So I got to meet him. Um, and I wanted to say two things. First off, I love the stories. You could have totally been a playwright. You've got some great stories for this. It's great. And my question is, um, of all the voice acting you've done, what's the, what's your favorite character of, to have voiced? And do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get into voice acting? Uh, let's see. Well, let's start with the um, the, the first is uh, I mean, it's Side Morgan Aqualad. I mean, really, really quickly. Uh, I play, uh, for those of you who don't know, I play, I also play a character, uh, Cy, um, uh, Aqualad from uh, Young Justice, which is a, a show that was on for a couple of seasons, and, um, and it's kind of all of the sidekicks of the Justice League. So, so Aqualad is obviously Aquaman's uh, sidekick, but they, they form their own group, and they do these kind of um, like special ops things. And it's kind of an adult cartoon. It's very... It's it's very deep. I would say it's very deep, and uh, and uh, and if you and uh, I, I thought it was one of the best TV shows, just period, not just cartoons. But um, but we're coming, we're actually coming back, and we're um, we're uh, doing uh, um, more episodes of Young Justice again, and um, and Aqualad. He's very different from Cyborg. Where Cyborg is very big and huge, and and kind of uh, wears his uh, heart on his sleeve, and is boisterous and exuberant, loud like me. And uh, and so, uh, but uh, Aqualad is 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 very contained, and uh, and uh, very serious, very focused, and um, and so I love the the two sides of both of those characters. So uh, you know, uh, if, if I had to pick, I would probably say Cyborg, but Cyborg and Aqualad, I love the juxtaposition of both of those. Um, as far as uh, getting into voiceover, uh, I never thought that. Voiceover wasn't like um, an end game for me. It wasn't what I, I just wanted to be an actor, and um, and so uh, I did everything I could to get on stage and get in front of people. And I did plays, and and uh, you know I did a little TV when I was a kid. And and um, if you're if you're like me, as a parent, if you want to do something that out there, you got to really beg because it's a it's a lot to ask. A parent to like take you out and make you, you know, to, to auditions and, and do all of these things. And so I begged and begged and begged and begged and pleaded to uh, to, to get my mom to, to take me to start doing things, a few things when I was a kid. And then I decided to go to, to college. I did. I was doing stand up when I was 13 years old and uh, uh, 14, 15. Um, and uh, I, I would like uh, go up to New York City by myself. Somehow I figured a way. And uh, and would do do stand up anything to get in front of somebody, and uh, and and the reason that I, I tell you that is because even as adult, as an adult, you have to have that same kind of drive because this is the best job in the world, and everybody wants to do this, and you, it doesn't matter how much it does matter a little bit. You got to have the talent, yes, but more importantly, you got to have the drive. Because the thing is, is that I just wasn't going to do anything else, you know? And sometimes, there are, I know, incredibly talented people, but people have told them no a few times, and they just went back home, because they're like, you know what? I don't like all this rejection, and, and dealing with rejection has so much to do with this business. But if you can get past that, if you can either let it galvanize you, and let it push you forward, or let it roll off you, some things, you know, I, I, you know, people have told me no, and, I, and I'll be like, okay, whatever, I'll just do the next one. And sometimes people tell me no, and I was like, what's your name? I'm gonna remember you. What's your name? One of these days, you're gonna remember me. And you're gonna be like, you know what, that was stupid. I should've said yes to him. And every once in a while, and every once in a while I let those things push me forward and, 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 and give me a reason to fight. And some things I let roll off my back like a duck's back. But, um, but you've got to fight for it because, uh, even when I was got out of college and uh, and I was moving to Los Angeles, and everybody was like, "You can't move to Los Angeles," and I was like, "That's where the acting jobs are. Of course, I'm going to move to Los Angeles." They were like, "It's a bad time." 
It was like, you know what, it's a bad time for 99% of the people who moved to Los Angeles to become actors. But I'm not the 99, I'm the one. And that's how you gotta think of it. And it's no matter what you do. You know, it's, it's not about just if you're an actor. I was just talking to somebody um, from Long Beach, actually, who, uh, and I was telling them that the woman who makes my wig, uh, her name is Victoria Woods, she, uh, she lives in Long Beach, and she is the wig maker to the stars. And if, uh, or people like me. But, but if, you're, if you're on TV or film, and uh, you need a, a wig made, that's where you go. And, uh, and there's just one of her. There's just one of her, and, and I'm sure that at some point she was like, I'm gonna be a wig maker. And somebody was like, you can't make a living doing that. And that's true. Most people maybe can't make a living being a wig maker. But you know what? She's the one. I drove down from, from where I live in Los Angeles to Long Beach because that's what you have to do. And it's not just because it was me. You know, a couple of days before, you know who had to drive down to Long Beach to this little bitty house to, to, to meet Victoria Woods to make his wig? Robert De Niro. Because that's where you go. Because she's the one. So you find that thing, whatever it is, that makes you tick, that makes you move forward, that gives you passion. It doesn't have to be anybody else's dream. If it's yours, then that's what you do, and you don't, and you don't let anybody tell you no. And here's the thing, when you find that thing that nobody can tell you no, then that's, that's how you know it's yours. And you be that Victoria Woods, right? And you make Robert De Niro drop the your house. Great question, thank you. Uh, who we have? I think somebody in the middle. Do we have any questions here? Okay, let's, uh, oh, wait, wait. this is where I started first. Yeah. But yeah, you don't need a mic. Thank you very much, Tony, for that wonderful question. How, what's the difference between live action and voiceover? Um, obviously, there's a difference, I guess, in, in, in how you use your imagination, right? Because, uh, because when you're doing voiceover, there's, uh, all you've got is a page in front of you. So you get, so I've got to build this entire world, you know. But uh, but the, but the truth is, is that is that no matter what uh, genre I'm working in, whether it's voiceover or uh, or live action, or if I'm or if I'm doing a play, you know what I mean? It's like I have to pretend like this. It, there, there's that fourth wall that's in front of me, right? But there's that fourth wall as well because there's this camera that's sitting here in my face. You know, there's always something that's, uh, that's artificial, right? That, uh, that I've got to kind of, you know, blow past. So, it's, uh, so, so to me, I try, I try not to think of them as different. Because, uh, because the truth is, is there's a level of, of having to mask the fact that there's something that's make-believe. Sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a tiger, you know? And she's right about here. She's literally right about here. That's her back. That's a back. And the funny thing, and you, you remember that first uh, um, uh, shot that you saw in the trailer, right? Where she, where she uh, uh, roared, and I kind of looked over at her. This is where my hand was, and there was nothing else there. And I remember looking over and going, I wonder what you're gonna look like. I hope it's good. Because if you look like the children here, if you look bad, I'm going to get in trouble. I, it was literally, if that, if that tiger looked bad, it was like, The Walking Dead's going down and it's all my fault, you know? But, uh, but, but literally, there, there's an aspect of, of imagination that, that, you've got to, that you've got to do yourself, you know? 
that I and and so and even if I'm if I'm standing just in front of a mic stand and a uh, and a music stand with a with a with a microphone there, or if I've got all of this stuff and I've got a hundred extras and and guns and, and and all of these things, still I've got to use my imagination. So to me, there's really no difference between voiceover and uh, you know and and uh, live action, you know, because uh, the more real I make them both. You know, then, then the, the better it is. And there, there's so many times, like when you're when you're in a play, and uh, you know, there, there's uh, there's no money, and so everything I've got. And so it's, there, there were times where I was like, well, if there's no money, why 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 do we? Don't give me a broom, you know. Don't give me a paint can. We'll just pretend everything is there. And uh, and if I believe it's real, then you're gonna believe it's real too. But at two hours that we're doing it, you know, that tiger wasn't real. But we all cry, you know, because I, I made it real, so it was real to us, right? That's how we do it. That's how we do it. Okay, next question. Let's get some hands up. Where see him? Uh, you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. Lisa was kind enough to just raise her hand without <laughs> talking. Lisa. I, you, go ahead, Lisa. It's all you. No, no, Lisa, take the microphone. Take the microphone. And you know that my 2016 Dodge Charger in Mango was uh, Shiva. Of course. I love you. Obviously, obviously, thank you. It, it really it, it hurt. It hurt. It did. It did. Do you, do you have a question? <laughs> no, baby. I thought you were just hitting the microphone. Oh, okay, I thought you were. I, I didn't realize you were putting your hand up like, help me, Jesus. No, I thought you were going to ask a question. Help me, Jesus. Okay, I, you know what? All right, I want you to put your hand in the air. All right, okay. I love you. I love you too. All right. Help Lisa, Lord. She's, she's going through a difficult time. Lord Jesus. Although she has her, her charger in Mango, she has lost her Shiva. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we need some help right now. If I can call on the spirit of Tom Payne to put healing powers. To put healing powers on Lisa right now. Because we all need a little help sometimes. We do, we do. That's right, that's right, that's right. So I want you to say, say right now, heal me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. No, no, heal me. Jesus. Yes, yes. Heal. All right, and, and do this. Heal me, Tom. Tom Payne. Absolutely, there we go. There we go. All right, now give the microphone back. Okay, there we go. Okay, we All right, now we got a question, question over here. What's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? Hi, I'm Barbara Mosias. I'm from Belton, Texas. Love it. And first time I got to talk to uh, Kyrie with you, we are on the Talking Dead, and I asked you how that Ezekiel learned to fight. You said WWE. But I was wondering, have you practiced anymore? Are you doing any better? Do you think you'll come back and you'll be able to beat Negan? First of all, yes. <laughs> you know why? Because uh, when, you, when you've lost as much as Ezekiel has lost at this point, he's ready to die. He's ready to die to, to, take, uh, to take out the saviors. You know what I mean? So I think that uh, I think that that uh, that uh, you know what Negan looks good with that bat on his shoulder, but I don't know if he's got the juice right now. Cause uh, cause uh, Ezekiel's got some juice, you know, and and, uh, and he's got some people that he needs to avenge. So so uh, so that's the way I feel about it. That's the way I feel. Yeah, can we get a mic over here? Or yell. Okay. Stop. Hey, stop so much related to the show. I love the show. Jerry, what are you doing? The 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 the
when we ask you guys, you guys always rise to the occasion. I'm, I'm, it's, it's an incredible blessing to have, to have this group of people that are brought together by this, uh, by this show. And I think it's because in some way we've all felt this way that we've been in this kind of untenable situation. You know what I mean? And you gotta fight your way out of, uh, of something that doesn't seem like you should be able to get out. You know what? But you find like-minded people and you fight your way out. And when people go through a tragedy, when people go, when, 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 a, when, a, when a, a town or, or a, a state gets hit by a hurricane, or an island gets hit by a hurricane, like we've all been hit by, you know, that's when we step up and we do it. And, and, and absolutely, and I'm, I've already been brainstorming, and trust me, we'll have other, other ways of, of, uh, of helping us all be able to, to give back to the community. You know, because if you're not doing it, doing something like this, you know, for that kind of reason, I mean, hey, it's great to have millions of people watching, but I tell you what, I've had people who have survived cancer, who have survived depression, who have survived, you know, uh, you know, family members who, who have gone through traumatic, you know, uh, upheaval, and they come to me, and you know what they say to me? They say, and yet I smile. And that, that's everything to me. You know? That's everything. So thank you guys for, for, uh, for, for, you know, answering the call when we ask you to, because it, it means so much. Absolutely. Now, the, the, the guy right behind you, too, he had a question. What was that? So, you're a person who's got a rich charisma both on and off screen. That's why you can see the village in the game from one So, my main question then to you is, uh, Who've been your comedic influences uh, during the developmental stages of your career and even now? And just who your influences have been, like performance-wise and uh, just actor-wise, like people used to look up to you, uh, even from, like, again, developmental period up until now. I wanted to be Eddie Murphy when I was growing up. I literally, when I was in middle school, I laughed like Eddie Murphy and, and just, and just lied to myself. I, was like, eh, eh, eh. I, I can't even do it anymore. I can't even do it anymore. I, I, but the funny thing was, is I lied to myself and just told myself I laughed that way, and just told me. And then I, it was like I was a sophomore in, in high school and realized that it had kind of like waned, and I stopped laughing like that. And I was like, oh my god. I literally lied to myself into telling myself I laugh like Eddie Murphy. <laughs> That's how much I wanted to be Eddie Murphy. And um, and and, so, and uh, my my friends in high school we would we would uh, sneak like like Richard Pryor tapes, you know, to listen to. I I had them memorized. I had I had Eddie Murphy's uh, Delirious memorized. Yeah. Absolutely. Put the boogie in your butt. <laughs> Such a stupid song. I sang it ad nauseum. But yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely wanted to be Eddie Murphy and I, I, I watched Beverly Hills Cop 2,000 times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and it was, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to be Eddie Murphy. Um, Robin Williams was a huge influence. <laughs> absolutely. Dude, when, when, when he died, and somebody put on YouTube, when, 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 the, uh, when he was in Hook, and that little kid was like pushing his face around, and he was like, there you are, there you are, Peter. I burst into tears, man. It's like, I, I mean, to, to be as, as, as open a creative force as Robin Williams, you know, I mean, I could only hope, I could only hope and I, I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live when I was in in uh, in, in, uh, in high school, and and, uh, and and finally, and then I and then I hung out with with uh, comedians and realized that they were all really depressed. And I was like, maybe I'll just go to college. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, yeah, Eddie Murphy, um, uh, Bill Cosby. <laughs> but he was, I mean, you know, I I, I had his albums. My first album was Mom's Mabley. If you ever, ever, Mom's Mabley was this woman from like well before I was. Uh, she was like from the '60s, and she was uh, she was like 
like 70 years old and had no teeth in her mouth, but I had an album of Mom's Mabley. And she would talk about her, her husband, who was so skinny, with big teeth, big, big, big feet. Looked like a golf club. And, uh, and, and you know, just, uh, just silly uh, uh, little, little stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, Robin Williams, Eddie Murphy, uh, Richard Pryor, those were, those were the ones, and, and, uh, and Bill Cosby. You know, um, what a shame, what a shame.